It's Wellness Wednesday. It's Wellness Wednesday. And this Wellness Wednesday, we're talking about disagreeing versus invalidating. This is continuing from Monday's video. The comments have been really good on that one. Had some really deep one-on-one -on -one conversations based on that too. And um yeah, more on that on Feedback Friday, specifically about that. But um, there's, there is different, a difference between disagreeing with someone's position and invalidating them while you're disagreeing. And this is something that is a learned skill. So if you don't know how to do it yet, don't feel called out. A lot of people are really, really bad at this. It is, I believe, something that unless it's pointed out to you, you're just sort of picking it up based on mimicry. A lot of our social learning is done based on mimicry and that sucks because for a lot of people, what they consider normal is getting them, you know, bad bad results and they don't know why because this is how everybody does it. First thing to keep in mind is you don't know the entire world. You can't say everybody. Um, so we'll we'll get into the difference between an invalidation versus a disagreement. Um, help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Or buy a one-time Leanna Care session for someone can use it but can't afford it. Coffee.com slash Leanna K. We are super close to like last week's goal. Oh no, we're, we're, we're super close to this week's goal. So I, I forgot to reset the Patreon, the, the, the coffee before I did this. I will fix that before, uh, this video goes live. So, all right, there we go. I'm all discombobulated, but okay. So you can disagree without invalidating and you can invalidate without disagreeing because validation is accepting the person's feelings and point of view, even when you don't agree with them. And, you know, people socialized male and people socialized female have, have different versions of invalidation. Uh, one person in, in the comments pointed out a version of, you know, you're so smart. If you could just get your marks up, compliment followed by invalidation because like, well, gee, if somebody's really smart and their marks are shit, then maybe they need some help with something, right? Like maybe there's something psychological going on or there's a learning disability that needs to be factored in. Gee, maybe it's not them, right? And that's a lot of people do things that are intended to be supportive, but really aren't because they're not showing respect for another person's feelings and point of view. And when it comes down to some of these really tough conversations regarding, you know, the big subjects, it can be really difficult because people will say something and it's just like, what? You know, that's just not true. And a lot of people try to argue facts when what they're looking for is validation and you can't really validate something that's not true. You can validate that, you know, for instance, this is a very personal subject for you. Um... And, and this is the sort of thing where if I start giving examples, there's going to be people who leap to invalidate me. And so I will, I will avoid that because no point in compounding the mistakes, right? So first off, it's very important that you show you believe what the other person is saying. 
and there's this social tendency it's it's gotten worse in the last eight years ever since the media decided that accusing people of lying was a perfectly acceptable thing to do without proof it started because of trump because in that case various newspapers said he's committing knowing falsehoods that's lying and of, of course whenever um somebody does something against a Republican politician, the Republicans just go, you lie and you lie and you lie and you lie and we all get a lie. And so it blunts the criticism. And that is incredibly invalidating because uh, at, that one caught me really flat footed because I was going, why did you lie? Why did you lie? And it, this was going on like during Gamergate. And I'm like, I didn't lie. And the weirdest one lately is some kiwi farmers like, why are you lying about kiwi farms? It's like, when the hell did kiwi farmers care about the truth? You know, they, they make up shit about me. They make up shit about other people. Live by your own rules, guys. Like, yeah, okay, it sucks to be lied about. Right? And you see... I even managed to validate something about kiwi farms. Yeah, it doesn't feel good to feel like you're being lied about. Which is why I don't understand why anybody does it. Like, you go out there and lie, it, it, you sort of lose the right to complain when somebody does it to you. You know, that's just hypocrisy. But during... Gamergate, for some odd reason, I mean, people were very emotionally reactive and it, there was an example where a little validation, even with disagreement, would have gone a long way and I got canceled from games journalism because I did that. Um, a reminder that I did a cosplay show for The Escapist, not games coverage. Yeah, because I was like, okay, I can't agree that I'm a horrible, lying, psychotic, grifting piece of shit just because I'm a games journalist, but there's clearly a very strong reaction and some sincere concerns, so let's hear it. I didn't have to accept all the shitty things people were saying about me, but I can go, look, you're clearly upset and that comes from somewhere real. Let's talk. That was the wrong answer according to, according to games journalism, but, and what's weird is you're taught that in interviewing, that if you put, an interview subject on their guard. You're going to get less from them when you're sort of, you know, like uh, Don Lemon did with Elon Musk. And, you know, Elon Musk got so validated that he said a bunch of things and then he fired Don Lemon. Um, that's the problem with interviewing your boss. Learn from Don Lemon's mistakes. So they're suing. So we'll see what happens there. But, um, yeah, there were some really sincere concerns about who games journalists were really writing for. And that's continued to this day. And, you know, with the the shuttering of Game Informer and, and, and the way they did that was shitty. Layoffs in the games industry are always shitty. I say this is, you know, when when the escapist got purged, people cheered because that was, you know, the bad website. It wasn't. It was a while I was there, it was a pretty cool place to to provide content for. Uh, you know, management was was decent. Um, they they cared no place is perfect, but you know, they did their best. And I can't say that about everywhere I've worked, but 
there was a because games journalism is a is a thing full of jargon intense can get really lost in things and there were never any deep philosophical discussions about what a well some guys tried like total biscuit rest in, rest in peace uh tried to sort of do some philosophizing about what does a review do what does a first look do right um and every site sort of had a different philosophy of that. When I did reviews, it was less about good game, bad game, and more what kind of person will like this game, right? That, you obviously have to play a lot of games and know a lot of people who... Um, like games that you don't like to to be able to do that effectively and that's why games journalism you need you needed a ton of knowledge base like you need to know art you need to know about tech you need to know about all this stuff and you got paid in games most of the time very 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 few people earn a living wage in games journalism and the people who do are now at you know major publications like forbes or um, Bloomberg, and we're assuming they make a full-time wage. We don't know. Um, but those are the minority. And, you know, those guys like him or don't like them worked a lot of years to get there. And so the pay for games journalists is usually shitty. Yet you need to know a lot to be good at it. And this was a thing I think could have created some interest convergence from the games journalists and the people who, you know, thought games journalism was being used to push an agenda. And everybody has their own internal philosophy about what games are, what they do, what they should be. And... I do think that paying people like shit means that people have to get something out of it. And if you're being paid like shit to write hot takes, then obviously getting your your opinion out there, the clout, the, you know, the enacting change sort of thing, that that becomes the compensation. There you go. Validating. And that doesn't take much. Granted, it's way easier to do that now when I was getting 500 profanity-laden tweets an hour um, calling me a shill and much worse uh, and, and telling me I should unalive. That did happen and yeah it see there was another thing of the fact that somebody can take out a twitter account right pro gamer gate on it and okay take your word for it and i i just thought that making those designations single identities was a mistake as well in terms of of the coverage on it and the discussion of it because you know one anti-gamer gator could just be like hey i want to pick on this type of guy fuck the fanboys and another guy can be hey no what you're saying about this stuff is not fair and i don't like that you harass my friend similarly um not Every gamer gator, like pro gamer gate person, was in it because they hated women. You know, it was not just a harassment campaign. That just wasn't true. There were a lot of people. What? It's interesting because what I heard from a lot of pro gamer gators was they just wanted a little validation from the industry that they looked up to. And boy, did we blow that. 
and there we go. The message I heard was wanting validation. And that took me on, on the journey to, to, you know, adapt my content because talking about games, sometimes you have to say, I don't like this. Um, I think this could have been done better. This just inexcusably sucks. And anybody who feels really, really connected to a franchise is going to get mad at you and go, you suck. You don't know anything about games. And yes, that is more of an assumption when you're female. Um, it just is. Doing content like this, doing mental health content, doing men's content that is affirming and not of the, you're doing everything wrong variety. I felt like I could make a more positive impact there than my completely screwed up and not neatly sorted anywhere opinions about video games. And so I decided to do this instead because... I'm just not, I don't need to be right about games. And because I find other ways to validate and the, the indirect validation that people get through being really good at a game or being an authority on Star Wars Expanded Universe and stuff like that, that's really poorly understood by um, by the industry. Shockingly poorly understood by the industry. It's, it's, it's weird. And like I had this really interesting conversation about the, the uh, Batman, was it Cape Crusader? I think it's a new Amazon show. And it's cartoon, like Bruce Tim, Batman the Animated Series style, uh, but it's set in the 40s and there are certain changes to it. And one is an absolutely terrifying reimagining of the Penguin as a woman, kind of, you know, Marlene Dietrich, if she was a Slovakian cleaning lady. Um, and... At first I was skeptical, but by the end of the first episode, I was just sold. She's terrifying. And Minnie Driver voiced her, which is interesting. But people are like, no, change. It's not the Penguin anymore. And I said, what is intrinsically male about the Penguin? Well, it's just the way it's always been. What's intrinsically male about the Penguin? There are certain characters, I will argue, need to be male because of various elements of them. Um, the Penguin, I thought about it. It's like crime boss, squank. That's sort of the, the defining. And I mean, the Penguin was changed a lot in the Tim Burton film. And that sort of stuck going forward in the comics of more of a sideshow birth defect thing they they sort of went halfway in the Rocksteady games with the beer bottle monocle. Um, but I said to this person, because going back and forth, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, this is pointless. So I said, are you saying that any changes mean it's not the thing anymore? And he said, yes. I said, okay, so that means that the Chris Claremont run on X-Men is no longer the X-Men because he added and, and adapted a lot, specifically um, making his version of Agneto and, and Xavier based on two prominent early Zionists. And he said, yeah, it's not X-Men anymore. And I'm sitting there going, okay, well, at least he's consistent. I think most people would say that Chris Claremont's X-Men is definitely X-Men, but by his standards, it's not. Okay, he's consistent. See, I don't have to agree to validate. You see how that works? And so when it comes to responding to something you don't agree with, I'm currently in the middle of a conversation. I'm not sure I'm going to continue 
with someone who believes centrists enable authoritarianism. I'm like, huh? Um, and it was weird because it spun out of a conversation that we were saying like both sidesism doesn't do much good. You know, you actually have to go based on who's doing what. And it, it went there. But I said, hold on. What's your definition of centrism? And of course, it was not the standard what, you know, what the textbook definition of centrism is, because that's a left right thing. Right. Not an authoritarian libertarian thing. And so, you know, their definition was basically an upholder of status quo. And so I said, well, if the status quo is not authoritarian, how does a centrist uphold authoritarianism? And I admit I didn't understand the answer, but sometimes just asking questions instead of going, no, you're wrong or disagree can be validating to a person who's coming at you in good faith and not in a state of reactance because at least they're getting a hearing, right? You're not prejudging them. You're not just rejecting them. And I find there's this habit and I don't know if it's just people who communicate on the internet a lot or, or this is just a widespread thing, but instead of going, okay, understand then offer agreement or disagreement if, if you feel it's warranted. Um, instead, someone will go, disagree. And I'll say to them, what, what does that do? I'm starting a conversation. Okay. Because <laughs> in my view, going disagree. Okay, you disagree. See ya. That ends the conversation to me because... I have no interest in wasting a lot of attention, a lot of time and attention on somebody who's had a knee jerk reaction and won't budge. Right. But it's, it's, this is a person who's clearly been taught that someone goes disagree and you have to prove them wrong. I don't play by those rules. I think that if someone goes disagree before they answer, they ask a single question that's that's a very close-minded point of view and not worth my time. And there is a way that people are unintentionally invalidating someone. If they just go, disagree or bad take, and they don't provide a single bit of explanation as to why they say that, they're not starting a conversation. They're just invalidating your viewpoint. Like, who am I to just go, disagree, and that's it? What do I know? I need to prove there's a reason to disagree there, right? Just makes sense to me. But other people have seen bad take, disagree, and they think, oh, that person's so confident. They're really not. Um, but, you know, that's a that's a topic for another time. They've just learned that this is how you talk on various message boards or social media. And it's not, by doing that, you're putting yourself above the other person and therefore invalidating them. Similarly, any rejection of a viewpoint based on your opinion that the person is just weird or not normal, similarly, and I, I know this is a, a Democrat attack line, against um republicans now and and that's i mean context i know that's one of it's a kamalism um kamalaism i guess yeah but um it's true that it's to me saying your political opponents are weird is better than saying your political opponent is evil okay i can support that change but just suggesting someone's opinion is invalid because they're not typical, they're not normal, they're not the ideal. Think about what you're doing there. 
And this is what really inspired uh, this video in the first place is looking at the um, responses to Manly Monday and, and some of the conversations that inspired that video was the, the fact that people don't realize that, you know, when I give them a compliment and they say they never get compliments from women and I say, you know, well, I just gave you one. And they're like, well, you're not normal, basically. Like, so you're saying I don't count? Okay. Okay. I'm not, I'm not the kind of woman. Okay. The, the, the acceptable women to compliment you is narrowing. You know what I mean? Like I've learned how to make a joke of it, but I remember when I was younger, that really used to sting me. The idea that my opinion wasn't valid because I wasn't a proper girl. And I find this interesting because the people, and it, it makes sense when you look at identity threat um, theory that the people who feel least secure, secure in an identity ca a category are more likely enforce the ideals or stereotypes or the, the prototypes as the, the literature calls it of the identity category. So if somebody does not feel properly male, then they're more likely to enforce, you know, ideal gender norms. Um, wild, huh? But it's that state of threat. It's like, I feel threatened as a man, therefore I'm going to defend masculinity to secure my places on the margins of masculinity, like putting up a big old phalanx, right? It doesn't make any logical sense, but reactance isn't logical. And so the only thing we can do about this constant ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, everybody wanting validation, a lot of people being too scared to go first or worse, self-sabotaging. So they are being invalidating, actively invalidating, don't realize it and therefore are less likely to get the validation from other people that they want because I mean reasonably why is somebody gonna go okay you just insulted me I'm not gonna be nice to you and no no one has to be nice to you after you've been rude and validating or insulting that's rewarding bad behavior that's not healthy boundaries healthy boundaries are look I I understand your feelings again you know you want to be validated by the industry that makes the stuff you love you you want to think that people who make the stuff you love don't hate you that's totally reasonable but how about putting your best self out there instead of doing a preemptive attack when you don't know how the person thinks or feels about you you're making a lot of assumptions and acting on them there's an example, again, of validating the perspective without agreeing. And the thing I like about that suggestion, it, it, it isn't always received well, but I'm prepared for that because sometimes in negotiations, your best offer is not going to be accepted. And cool, right? At least, you know, you tried. You offered a fair deal. If it doesn't work for them, that's cool. And these sorts of things are negotiations. And that's where the self-validating comes in because I go into it going, okay, this person's just been a jerk. Likely scenario, they're going to continue to be a jerk, but this could be a good person who's hurting, who's just acting like a jerk instead of being a full-time jerk. So I'm going to give him a chance, right? If he continues to act like a flaming asshole, well, I gave him a chance, right? Which is more than I had to. It was a choice. And yeah, rejection hurts, but that doesn't mean you have no boundaries because you are desperate for acceptance. Because what happens when you believe you don't deserve boundaries because of the rejection you felt in the past, pausing the video. Okay, so unpausing, 
I just had to do an hour long phone call. So <laughs> I am picking up where I was left off to end this video. This is my life lately, guys. But yeah, the whole life, th the whole thing about people having no boundaries. Uh, so people will, you know, not kick you out and then expecting to treat people badly and have them prove to you that they're safe. That doesn't work if, if that's why you're doing it. Uh, people don't have to take abuse. And if you object to this statement, congratulations, you have been abused. Um, you can't insult people into caring about you. Testing people all the time that way, they will get worn out. And that's, you know, two things I keep in mind for that one. The person in front of you didn't hurt you. Don't assume they're out to hurt you. Uh, I tell myself that a lot. Um, that, you know, that was the main thing. I talk about this all the time that you guys taught me that you don't see who I was when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult or anything like that. You see me now. And so things I have really good reasons for just seem like an asshole because you guys don't know the context. But also I really worked on that internal validation and I treat people the same way I try to treat myself which is with compassion and benefit of the doubt. And I think that that there's not enough of that. There's not enough modeling that because let's face it, you don't get clicks. You don't get likes for being compassionate. You get canceled. And I just decided I don't care. I'd rather have, you know, you guys who watch my content regularly and watch for me, not because of the algorithm. And we can have really good conversations and learn from each other. And you know, I do other things for money. I don't have to chase traffic. That's really nice. It's validating. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Leanna K. Or buy a one-time Leanna Care session for someone who can use it but can't afford it. Coffee.com slash Leanna K. We are well on track for this week's goal. Um, sorry about the jump in the video. It couldn't be helped. Thanks for watching and be well.